trying to produce change. And I mean, in New Zealand, with respect, uh, half the people that have tried to do that are in this room, and um, the other half um, would make up less than the fingers on two hands. And I think that we have erred in not trying to get enough people on board locally. And that's why I said, I mean, I really took what Joe Goodhue said this mm. morning. We really need to do more locally. We need to prove locally that things work. And I think, I don't know how many people here are on school boards of trustees. But I mean, I think uh, there probably are a number. And I think it's if, if enough school boards of trustees took action, maybe government would decide that perhaps um, NAG 5 was not such a bad idea after all. Any um, other, any other panellist who wants so, to, um, to have a go? Wayne. As chair, as chair of a board of trustees of the biggest school in the country, let me respond to you. Um, wearing another hat. Um, I, I think there's another elephant in the room, other than the one you talk about, Boyd, and that is we've focused a lot, or just recently talked a lot, about one end of the axis, which is the bit that goes in the mouth, and we haven't talked too much about activity levels either. Um, so I think we need to kind of balance the equation here, and if, if, if you want to look back over 20 years, then one of the major changes that have occurred in adolescent and primary school children is reduced physical activity, and everybody in this room knows that. Um, one of the points that I would make is that schools are often seen as the easy place to do things in the community, and it's almost at times like abrogation of, of family and parental responsibility, just or do it at school. Sex education, diet education, all the exercise so that when they come home they don't have to do anything. Um, so, you know, I do think there is some shared responsibility. Um, and I, the other thing I, I think I'd like to say is that if there are going to be changes or interventions, let it be based on science as opposed to what we think might be a good idea and it might lead to a good outcome. Um, and there are a number of interventions around things like, um, for example, changing what children have access to eat at school, the issue of fizzy drinks at school, and to say, well, look, if we do that, that will fix the obesity epidemic, if that's all we do. And the answer is that won't work, if that's all we do. Jacqueline, you've got, I see you are wanting to make some comment, if oh, you're head oh, nodding. It's such a, uh, Microphone. It's such a very big problem. And what I see with people of my generation is trying to reward their children or compensate for their children, to their children, for things that they feel they ought to have done, like be home when they got back from school. And the whole fizzy drink issue, for those of us who grew up in, yeah, it's on, it's little green light. A little green light is showing. Can the volume, please, on the microphone? A little one. green light is showing. That <laughs> fizzy drink appears to be normal these days. And the, it, I have been in a supermarket and seen a four-year-old rush, say, mummy, mummy, can we have these? And it was a bag of kiddie apples. And the mother said, not if you want Cocoa Pops. Hmm. Okay, next question. <laughs> Down the front here. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, from Brisbane. I'm a paediatric endocrinologist. And my question, or my comment, is directed to the whole panel, but in particular to Professor Mann. I agree with you that when you really want something done or you want resources for your patients, you mobilise the public, you mobilise the families, you don't tell them what to do, but you ask them if there's anything they can reasonably do, please do it. And they don't take long before they decide to write letters and pick at the school fate and the local minister. The point of what I'm saying is, though, I think we're dealing with a different group when we're dealing with children and families where obesity is already a problem. They're a very disempowered, in my experience, disenfranchised group who run from any publicity or notoriety. And I certainly wouldn't, as a clinician, um, request any family to draw attention to themselves or their children. Could you comment on the sort of disparity between asking the family, perhaps of a child with type 1 diabetes who's otherwise completely fit and healthy, to go, you know, to, to go to the 
extreme of whatever they can do, as opposed to the family of a child who is already morbidly obese and there are no resources for them. Jim. Yeah, I mean, I think you raise some very interesting points. Um, but I think one, I, I spend quite a lot of my time seeing families with diabetes. Um, but I think it's very different when you talk about individual families and when you talk about public health. I mean, I am here today really talking about public health. And I think one can um, mobilize people in a, in a totally different way uh, from what one would do with families. And I just want to give you one example. I'll come back to being an optimist again. I mean, I spent a large part of my life commuting between Oxford and London uh, in England in the days before non-smoking was uh, the order of the day. And I actually wrote a letter to British Rail saying that um, it was outrageous that there were only two coaches on the train that were non-smoking. And British Rail wrote back to me saying that uh, I was being absolutely stupid. Why should nobody would want more non-smoking carriages? Now, at the same time in New Zealand, uh, Sir David Hay wrote to Air New Zealand, which I think was probably still called Teal Air in those days, and wrote and had a virtually identical letter. We've both got copies still of our letters, and he got the same response from Air New Zealand and his predecessor. So, I mean, I think attitudes do change, and I think what may be something, you know, that we couldn't, you know, taboo topics that we couldn't cover at a population level, I think are now things we can cover. I think we've just got to get this message across that it's critical. I too have been chair of a board of trustees for a very long time, not the biggest one in New Zealand, and I think I'm not for one minute saying that it should all be concentrated on schools, of course not. But one can do things in schools, and it's amazing how quickly uh, resistance changed. Uh, Rachel Taylor, who's here, one of my colleagues from Dunedin, we set up one of the early um, intervention studies in the community which involves schools in a small area in, in North Otago. And when we first did it, there was tremendous opposition when, we, when kids were told, or parents were told, they couldn't bring junk food in their lunch boxes, and they couldn't bring fizzy drinks. The, the opposition disappeared in, uh, in about two weeks. It all fizzled out, and everybody just did what they were meant to do. So I think there are things we can do to come into labor. I don't think we should stigmatize families, and I agree with you entirely. And when we work with families, we have to, have to adopt a totally different attitude. Next question, here in the center. I'm Barbara Brew, just a member of the public. Um, it's been so interesting listening to the various speakers, but my heart keeps on going back to the fact that my work's mainly among the poor and the disadvantaged. I do want to say that we need to encourage ways of getting vegetables and fruit into homes. You have a family, say, with six kids. For goodness sake, the cost mounts up far more than probably the income into that home. So we need to think about how we can get vegetables and fruit growing in the schools in vacant land, how we can encourage the production of food that can be accessible to the poor and the disadvantaged. I think that's all because everyone naturally understands what I'm saying. But just that we always remember as we talk about going into schools, it's no use telling kids you need to do this and that and don't bring this and that when probably that means nothing to those that have got so little in their homes. Is so anyone do on encourage the that in the schools and in the vacant properties that there is vegetable and fruit being grown. I see so many decorative trees going in. Why not have trees going in with fruit on them? Good point. Anyone on the panel wants to talk about either gardens at schools or dare I say it, when we were kids, there was a school garden program. We were all given our packets of seeds to go home and were taught to grow gardens at home. But anyone want to comment on how you get the conversion that accessible and affordable vegetables uh, into the hands of the people who are least able to purchase them? Well, in the United States, we've just legislated it. So that's one way to work it. We just rolled out a whole new school meal policy where the kids have to take a couple of vegetables and fruit at every meal. What's att attracted the press's attention, which is really quite extraordinary, is um, a big brouhaha about uh, limiting the calorie intake in school lunches now. It used to be, as I said, we came from this, this sense of kids not getting enough food, and then suddenly, uh-oh, the kids are really getting obese. So for the older kids, the limit is 850, 875 calories at lunch. 
And this is what's hit the media, that the kids are saying they're hungry. They wouldn't be hungry on that amount of calories if they ate the food. I mean, they're saying they're hungry because they don't want the healthy food. But uh, they have to be offered it now. We've switched to whole grains and, and a lot more produce. So that's one way to do it. You, you have the government intervention. Wayne. I guess the, the, the point, I guess, though, is, um, is the affordability, which I think is what you're alluding to, of fresh food, fruit and um, vegetables. And, uh, and what you're saying is if we did legislate that kind of behaviour as has been done, obviously in parts of the US, then there'll be families who will simply break whatever rules are set because they, they can't afford fresh fruit and vegetables and that processed food is much, much cheaper. So Any it, other it is comments? a problem. No? Uh, there's a question down the back. Yes, hi, uh, Doug Salmon here, um, University of Otago Christchurch. Just want to come back to uh, the elephant in the room that uh, Boyd uh, identified just before uh, and focus in on specifically the marketing. And um, I'd like to get a comment, if I could, from, from anyone on the panel. But uh, looking at the title here, For Our Children's Children, we've got a, um, a junk food industry out there who's targeting, specifically targeting our children with these recreational products that they, they have the gall to actually call food, um, when in fact they are, they're, they're something else. Um, and... and, and, and I think that we've, we've, we're seeing a degradation of food, a kind of a recreationalisation of food um, by an industry that really hasn't got any interest in the health of our children. Please give me some comments, perhaps some optimistic comments. I know that in the alcohol area, the, the science behind marketing uh, is, is growing. It's a very hard area uh, to, to research. Um, but uh, I... Um, the dismantling of marketing, stopping this industry targeting our children. What do you think? Anyone on the panel wanting to uh, proffer ideas on what might work? I mean, Boyd and there's been a number of there have been a number of questions of how do you convert the public health message into a meaningful change? So who do we need to get in our sights? What does the uh, parliament need to do to either constrain or, or prohibit? Uh, what do you think would work? Is there any experience from the US that uh, can guide us? Yeah, um, one of the um, things, and this really stems from what Jim said that uh, people are talking about is, is building communities of pressure. I mean, kind of like we, we got to the um, social unacceptability of smoking, getting to the point where communities really find what's going on with the marketing and with our kids socially unacceptable. So you have a community that, that builds um, behind positive messages, healthier foods being messaged to our, our kids. Um, the food industry is going to respond to demand. They're there to sell food. So it really has to come from us and, and really pulls back to what Jim was saying, that we, we have to create um, a social undesirability to have all our kids getting fattened up. I mean, Jim. <laughs> well, I mean, I would have to say that it's very difficult for any government to legislate against marketing, and we should be aware that the previous uh, government with a different political hue had as much difficulty as the present government does in legislating. And I couldn't agree more. We are going to have to, if we're going to achieve anything, it's going to have to be public pressure. I shall say tomorrow when I give a talk, a video of what Coca-Cola is doing. And I think it will, if anybody hasn't seen it, it will shock. And I don't know how else we can do it other than creating public awareness and pressure. Jacqueline, any comments from you? Coca-Cola is the most frequent thing, item, in the New Zealand food basket, apparently, followed by bananas. And Barbara and I talked about this earlier, and she said you can't switch from Coke to water, which would seem to me to be a fairly obvious thing, because one comes out of a tap and it tastes quite good in New Zealand, except in Auckland, really. But Barbara has pointed out that actually that's not a switch that people can make easily. But Diet Coke is there without the, the amount of sugar. And aspartame seems to be mostly okay at the moment. So th that sort of education really needs to be done. 
are fundamental challenges. Some of you will find out on Saturday if you actually look at the Listener or the Herald or whatever. We have six and a half hours of cooking programs on Saturday. We have about three every night. And it's turned into entertainment. And people are spending more time watching those programs than they are actually doing the preparation. And by the way, you get ridiculed if you burn something. So these programs are not helping us at all. And they increase the waste, of course, because they're not fantastic. And then we have food in a minute, which is all about opening cans and taking things out of the freezer. And I'm perfectly happy with fr frozen in a minute peas because they really are nutritionally great, but that extra cost for most of that is quite ludicrous. And so I think we're actually disenfranchising, disempowering people in terms of being able to cook healthy meals from the start. And maybe that's the sort of basic cookery we need, and frankly, I'd rather have it in the NCEA system than most of the subjects we do have. But Domestic who... science, wasn't it? <laughs> So we've, we've had the problem continually described. I want to hear the solution. Wayne. I wasn't really going to add a solution, but a, but a question to ask, so I'm sorry. Uh, I don't think anybody would disagree that the amount of money spent in marketing food and soft drinks right at the top of that pyramid is enormous, and if we looked at fast foods, they're energy dense, they're often high in fat, high in sugar, high in salt. So on balance, we think that they're a bad thing. Now, in terms of trying to put it into perspective, if there is increasing cry for intervention and it moves all the way to banning, and I think Jim made the comment that you know that that, that it becomes an exceeding, incredibly difficult thing to do and a difficult thing to achieve, um, if we're going to start creeping that far, we need to ask what difference it makes. In other words, what is the evidence behind it? Now, I'm not saying that there isn't, because I think there quite probably is, but. There, if you look at the evidence that says if you ban food A, that will make this much difference to a, a child or a person's weight gain. There are other lifestyle events that end up crossing over and correcting. So I'm not saying that food advertising is good because I think it is rather excessive, but I do think we need to understand what the impact of it is, particularly if we want to adopt you know, more tougher policies and rules, which may well be inevitable, but I do think we need to better understand what the consequences of, the, of, of food if, advertising actually is. If I can be slightly challenging as the next questioner uh, turns their mind to the question, um, for my sins I have to follow both heart and diabetic uh, risk features in, in my own life. And I'm always incensed when I ask uh, my good friends at the Heart Foundation, who I, I do work with closely, why the red tick has not been joined by some sort of sugar measure. That the red tick effectively is a representation of the fat content in you know, the best in class. And do you know that when I've asked this marketing question, because there's clear evidence that if you give people signals of the best in class, people who have that disposable income and the inclination, they don't want to have to necessarily be the grid reader on the back of the packet. And so all of us, busy as we are, are looking for simplification in signalling. And Jim, this may distress you, but my, the only reasonable answer I've had explained so far is the competition between the big sectors of diabetes and heart haven't found a way to collaborate to get a symbol that is both best in class in fat and sugar. Now, if that's true, then I throw the challenge back. Uh, because marketing has to be easy for the people who are constrained in time and wanting to make good choices. And I think how good are we making, or how easy are we making that uh, set from a public health point of view? I'm not saying either the diabetes uh, teams or the Heart Foundation teams or any other group have got this right or wrong, but the concepts of collaboration worldwide where you get interest groups collaborating, you do get change. We know that on many fronts today. And I suspect converting public health messaging into shifts that alter marketing and, and consumption behavior probably requires innovation in the collaboration and branding that makes the speed and ease of how you meet the market uh, respond to some of the concerns you've got. So it's just an observation. We have time for about two more questions. I'm aware that we've gone over the, the, the seven o'clock, but if anyone has got an itching question in the audience, we're certainly going to take it here on the aisle. This is more of a comment. Um, is that working? Yes. Okay. Um, in, in terms of what Jacqueline was saying about the um, 
price of fruit and vegetables not having, in fact, having come down over the years. And I hear a lot of comments about the unaffordability of fruit and vegetables, but I just wonder if they really are unaffordable or if the marketing um, is, is what is, uh, the, the marketing of other products is taking away from the fruit and vegetables. And also the margins that the supermarkets are putting on fruit and vegetables. I mean, we know for a fact that the markup is at least 100% on fruit and vegetables in the supermarket, in some cases 200%. For things like uh, manufactured products, we're looking at a quarter of that. And is that an area that we can, we can attack it? The other th the interesting thing that um, I thought perhaps Jacqueline could also comment on is if you looked, and I'm sure you've looked at it, the, the extent of waste food in the world what does that mean? If, if we did change that over the period of time, what would that mean in, in terms of the amount of extra land that we would have to bring into production to feed the people through to 2050? We would Jacqueline. Have, we've got enough food now to feed the people. We throw away overall about half the food that is purchased. So a third goes before harvest, a third goes after. And then what gets back to the house, half of it goes. Two kilos a year, just um, two kilos a week in New Zealand per person, just over that for Australia. It's a huge amount. And most of it is the perishable stuff. So you're talking the milk, potentially the yogurt, huge amounts of yogurt go out of supermarkets. Of interest, um, I've heard recently from one of my lovely students that eight bottles of nine of organic milk goes out because people change their minds at the moment where they see how much extra it is. So huge amounts of food, yes, we could solve it, but the problem is the perishability, and people do not manage food well these days. And you know, the limp broccoli, or the icky looking, it, it, and how much have you paid for it? It's that sort of statement. That's why the frozen component actually is really important. I think we're not using th that sensibly. So yes, we could fix it. And what about the supermarket, mark supermarket markup? They will say, any supermarket will say, they've done it recently for milk, that we make only 4% on milk, but they don't mention that's every day. And if you've got a stock turn on a daily basis, that adds up on over 365 days. It's a lot they make. Little potatoes, I've heard recently, $3 to the grower for you know, a bag, $9 in the supermarket. Let us challenge the supermarkets, but we acknowledge they give us mostly safe food, as long as we've checked the best before date or whatever. But there's another thing. How bad is it after the best before? We've had one of the target programs here recently on that. What's the difference between the expiry, the best before, and should we actually be sorting out what levels we really have in our foods and if any of the mycotoxins or E. coli or whatever, because mostly in New Zealand and in Australia, we are very lucky. Any other co uh, comment from the panel? And so the last question, who's going to catch my eye? Uh, down here. Thanks very much. It's been a fantastic discussion. My name's Anna Peters. I'm the president of ANZOS. So I just kind of wanted to end with a, a call to action, really, to, to echo what's been said. And I think I agree we can debate the details, and I would totally take the point that we need to be as cohesive as, as possible on the particular strategies forward. But I think we do know that if we're going to decrease the prevalence of obesity, both in the target groups that are at high risk and across the population, and if we're going to do it in a way that doesn't increase the social disparities we're already seeing, which we know is a consequence of educational strategies, then essentially, as, as Boyd and others say, we need to make the default options the healthy options. And at the moment, they're not.